So hi everyone, welcome to the Lewisboro Library's presentation of the history of slavery in Lewisboro. We are so happy to have town historian Maureen Cole with us here today to lead this program. Maureen has been the town historian since 1986. In that capacity, she has graciously shared her knowledge of Lewisboro history through numerous programs at the library, in the schools, and currently via a series about our hamlets that is being run through parks and recreation on Sunday afternoons. Maureen has written a number of history books about Lewisboro, all of which are available for sale at the library. I will now turn this over to Maureen Cole. Thank you very much, Liz. And uh, we're off on another Sunday afternoon adventure through history. Why slavery? Well, it happened this way. I was looking, oh, maybe before I get started, but we're looking at is an overmantle. It's called the Van Bergen Overmantle. And if you wanna see it in person, I believe it's on display at the James Fenimore Cooper Museum up in Cooperstown. It's supposed to depict uh, slavery in New York State. And it is supposed to have within it uh, not only African Americans, but Native Americans as well. It's a little hard to see on the screen. I think you have to see it in person, but um, that's, that's what the website from the museum said, that it was depicting slavery in New York State. Anyway, I decided that maybe a program on slavery in our town would be an interesting thing because in looking through the census, the different censuses for uh, just different families in town, I began to notice in the 1790 census, hmm, there are a lot of, a number of families that are indicated as owning slaves. When I counted them all up, there were 19 slaves listed for, for Salem families in 1790. So I went ahead and I looked at the 1800 census because the federal census are done every, every 10 years. And usually, usually in between that, there is a, a New York state census that happens occasionally in, in the in-between years. But anyway, in 1790, there were 19 slave slaves within Salem. In 1800, there were 12. And in 1810, there were eight. And then in 1820, there were two. By 1830, there were no more slaves in Westchester County, although there were 75 slaves in New York State. And by 1840, there were no slaves listed in, in our state. So I thought this might make an interesting program. This is not a symposium or a discussion of the injustices of the institution of slavery. It is an historical look at our town in the first half of the 19th century and the families that lived here and farmed here. There is very little written evidence of the existence of, of enslaved persons in our town. Our town records say nothing at all, or very little. Um, or there are, and, the, and they are not mentioned in family journals or diaries. So it is kind of hard to gather a lot of information. Really, birth records were written in the town, in the town records, uh, because owners wanted to enter a legal notice of property. In Richfield, uh, where I, I kind of looked at some Richfield information because actually, actually at some point during this time, we were all, we were all Connecticut. Lewis, uh, South Salem and, and, and Richfield were joined. Um, the Richfield records are a little bit more, uh, more involved. There, there is more you can find in the Richfield records. However, more often in our early town records from the 1740s to the 1750s and 60s, there were the animal branding notes. Occasionally there'll be births, but I only know of one instance where a birth uh, happening in a slave family was recorded. And in the census, 
it's hard to tell. You don't get names. You get the name of the head of the household, and that is all, and how many persons and what ages they are, but not their names. And uh, in the 1790 and the, the uh, 1800, and I believe the 1810, there was a category uh, for slaves, but also for other free persons. Other free persons might have been freed slaves, might have been Native Americans, and might have been indentured servants. Now let's be looking at this for a while. Let's try another slide. Uh, this was a slide I found actually in the Katona, uh, the Katona history book, Katona, the history of a village. And it is an advertisement that appeared in the Hudson River, in a Hudson River New Chronicle newspaper in 1838. And its date line is Somerstown, which of course is right across the Croton River from us. And this isn't actually a slave, it is a runaway indentured servant who uh, an entered apprentice who was a carpenter and apparently had had enough of it after four years and decided to run away. So while you're reading that, I will continue with my rather lengthy interview here, uh, uh, introduction. However, freedom, let me see now. Yeah, freedom was complicated. During the Revolutionary War, Owners could be compensated for allowing their slaves to enlist in the, in the war effort. And if they did, they were promised their freedom at the end of the war. That was the Patriot side. The British side were also encouraging runaway slaves and they promised them also, if they'd fight for the British at the end of the war, they would be given their freedom. And eventually many, Many people took up that opportunity, and at the end of the war, they were uh, they were brought up to Nova Scotia and and were became British subjects. The, um, now, for several different slave slave laws in New York State or emancipation laws, I should say, 1799, the Gradual Abolition Act was uh, abolition, the gradual abolition law was enacted. This freed children of slaves born after July 4th, 1799. However, they weren't freed right away. They were freed men at the age of boy, uh, a male birth at the age of 28, a female at the age of 25. So even though they were declared uh, emancipated in 1799, they still had a a several decades of inservitude. Then in 1817, an act freeing those born before 1799 would be free on July 4th, 1827. Well, that's, that's 17 years later. Then again, in 1827, slavery was abolished in New York State. But this was also uh, people of uh, um, African ancestry were also subject to a federal law of the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, which meant that slaves, this is where bounty hunters came in from the South, they would come to the North and they were free to um, capture any runaway slaves, slaves and return them back to their owners. Sometimes a slave was given freedom upon the owner's death. I, uh, and then I, but, and some were not freed, but just um, they were inherited by, by surviving members of the family. Now, where did they come from? Why did, they, why did slaves appear here in our little backwater of a town? Many of our Salem founding families came from New England, a lot from Connecticut. Connecticut had more slaves than any other New England state. It seems kind of hard to believe, but that, that was a fact. Richfield, which is where I drew a little uh, from for this, for this uh, talk, did not have that many, but they did have a fairly sizable uh, freed Black population. 
New York State too had uh, a very large proportion of um, slaves. Now we'll continue on our little, get started on our journey. Here's a map from 1858. And I'm just showing it to you because, well, this is, this is uh, the names of a lot of the people who owned property in 1858 in our town. It's a little later than the era we're talking about, but you'll see names that I will be mentioning. Halstead is a name, Eight is a name. Uh, and I think we're going, Benedict is a name. So um, I just wanted to give you an idea of where these people live. This is close to the North Salem line. And at this point, we were, uh, North Salem and South Salem had been, had been uh, divided. Lake Wakabuck. And as we go out toward the left side of the screen, we're going toward Golden's Bridge. And you can even see that uh, was on the map, it was called Golding Bridge. So that can uh, go along with what name is Golden's Bridge? Was it Gold's Bridge, Golding's Bridge? Or, or how did it get its name? Anyway, so we're talking about the Northern area of town and the central area of town. Now, these are kind of screenshots that I took of what a census looks like. And this is the census, uh, what the census of 1790 would have looked like. You can see names of the head of families, and it goes to how many males, how many free, how many free males over a certain age, free females. Uh, and again, the next to the last column is other freed persons which I explained might be freed slaves, it might be indentured servants, or it might be Native Americans. And the last column is for slaves. This nine is uh, indicative of how many uh, slaves have been indicated in the pages before the page were on. And here you can see that Enoch Mead, who lived, was the first Mead to populate Mead Street, had two slaves. And Gould Boughton, who probably lived in the area of Boughtonville, which uh, is the, if you, you think about the back, the rear entrance to Ward Pound Ridge Reservation, that's where Boughtonville is on Route 124 as you head toward Bedford. So that's what the census looks like. And that's uh, a very incredible piece of uh, uh, paper if you're trying to do research on the families that lived here. This is uh, the census of 1800, which is looking a little different, a little less cluttered, but it's still only asking for free white of males of certain ages, free white females of certain ages. Again, uh, other free people and then slaves. And here, the one slave that, uh, we'll be talking about or mentioning is Nathan Rockwell and he had one slave. We need to go back. Here's the distribution of slave owners in Salem, uh, South Salem. It wasn't South Salem until 186, but uh, we did change names in here. And here is a list of the, I believe, 11 families and the 19 slaves that uh, were extant in 1790. I tried to, uh, by looking at the census, and back in those days, the census was taken by somebody going from house to house. So you could pretty much uh, extrapolate what part of town the people were living in. So uh, John Allen, I'm assuming he was kind of toward the Vista area. Enoch Mead was in Wakabuck. He was on Mead Street. Um, majority of them are South Salem with a couple of, this is the Michael Halstead who we saw on the map just a couple of slides ago up near the North Salem border. David Brown, I think was out um, in the uh, Todd Road area. Joanna Brown, different family. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit about Joanna and her her family, her her father and uh, and uh, brother-in-law were Browns, 
and this is this is her nephew. Isaac was her nephew. Then we had Gilbert Reynolds from Cross River, and then the Todd family, which who were probably the most prominent family in the Golden Bridge area. Uh, this chart will be. You won't see the chart. Hopefully, I will remember where I want to be on this chart. I will be looking at the chart. Keep my head together. Um, Amos Benedict had one slave in 1790, and this is actually his son, who probably inherited the slave from his father. And Roger Brown, keep your eye on Roger Brown, who may or may not be related to David. I couldn't, um, couldn't tie them up, and I know he's not related to Joanna Brown, but for a man who seemed to have a lot of property and a lot of a lot of indentured help or, or enslaved people helping him. I could not find his name on the map. Here we have Elmdon or Elmdon. Uh, Meads, one of the early, first houses on Mead Street. This was Enoch Meads, um, Enoch Meads house. And uh, I can just uh, see what I, yeah, we're going, to, we'll see. Enoch Mead had, had two slaves, a lot of children. He came to town in 1776. He fought in the revolution. He died in 189, uh, but he left quite a legacy for our town, for Wakabuck especially, and gave his name to Mead Street because his relatives and all his children uh, began over the years to inhabit the, the area. Now, this is the one record that I could find in our town records. It's been transcribed, so it it just looks like 1890s typing. This is to certify that there was born of a black slave named Hager, the property of Enoch Mead, a male child named Boris on the second day of July, 1802. Uh, signed by Enoch Mead and notify, uh, notarized by Aaron Keeler, the town clerk. And about a year and a half later, this is to certify that there was born in my house, a black male child, the 29th of December, 1803, named Morris. Enoch Mead, again, notarized by Aaron Keeler, the town clerk. Now, my question, after I thought about this a little bit, was um, Enoch Mead has only been um, noted for having two slaves. But now he's got two more because he's had two children born uh, on his uh, on his farm. This is uh, Halsted Cemetery, and that's the only thing I could find to make us think about Michael Halsted, who was um, a slave owner in the Golden Bridge area. And the Halsted Cemetery is on 138, not too far off of. Uh, 121 as you go toward Golden Bridge. It's on the south side of 138 and it's kind of near where Sullivan Road meets 138. So if you're looking on the left before you get to one, uh, Sullivan Road, you will see this cemetery. At the time that I took this picture, or I did not take this picture. This picture was taken by someone else, but at this time, the cemetery was in fairly good repair. Unfortunately, it doesn't look that good right now. The next slave owner was Amos Benedict. Uh, and this is the house, probably Amos Benedict's house. You might not recognize this house today, but if you know where uh, Oscalita Road and Twin Lakes Road is, this house is on the corner of Oscalita and Twin Lakes Road. It belongs to Fred and Tina Coles right at the present. And uh, this, the Benedict farm was very large. It encompassed a good deal of the area uh, from downtown South Salem now up into the area where Lake Wakabuck and the Three Lakes are. And when Liz and I were looking at this a little earlier, something I really had never thought about before, but there are two people, probably Benedicts. And then Liz, I found another one. There's a gentleman sitting here on a chair near the, uh, actually this goes down a ways. This is the entrance to the basement and the huge big fireplace that's in this house. 
these women look like dolls, but when you extrapolate and put a couple of inches up here by the door, they probably were regular sized people. Anyway, um, I'm going to read you from Amos Benedict's uh, Last Will and Testament. Amos was born in 1722 and he died actually on my birthday, July 29th, 1809, a few years before I was born. But in his, in his will, <coughs> uh, after liberally remembering his heirs, whoops, after liberally remembering his heirs, he emancipated his slave Jono for faithful service and devised to him and his heirs five acres of his farm, also an acre of meadow, one cow, one feather bed with pillows, sheets, and coverlets. However, uh, all right, that's the will, but here's the however. Poor Jono appears to have had a hard struggle with life and freedom. For in 1813, a neighbor, Daniel Jones, appealed to the surrogate for letters of administration of all goods, chattels, and credits, which were, uh, which, uh, and personal, I'm sorry, which were of Jono, a black man, late of South Salem, stating that Jono's personal property was insufficient to pay his debts. Therefore, the surrogate ordered the sale of his six acres of land, which were bought by Jonah Benedict, and thus returned to the farm. So poor Jono had a few years of being his own master and with his own farm, but unfortunately it didn't last. This is the house of Jonah Benedict. And if anybody recognizes this house, it's on Benedict Road, which goes between Post Office Road and Oscalita Road. It was also the house, it was the house of uh, Mary Knapp was the last Benedict to live in this house. And this house is a beautiful, beautiful salt box on Benedict Road. And that was the home of, of, uh, of Jonah Benedict who got poor Jono uh, inheritance. Now, this, this is going to be, I'm going to read about several different people here. And this is the Brown family of South Salem. Not to be confused with the Brown family of, of uh, Golden's Bridge area. This is a picture that I usually use for my ghost program because it, there's a ghost story associated with this. But we're not gonna talk about the ghost story. We're gonna talk about the, uh, the lives of Old Tower and his compatriots. Um, James Brown Sr. was one of the Richfield proprietors and was granted about 500 acres of land in, that was in Salem. And his land went almost up to the Lake Wakabuck area too. Uh, he had several slaves, but uh, he also passed away in, um, well, actually he died in 1769, but I do have his will and testament. And that's what uh, kind of leads us to his slaves belonging to Joanna Brown. So I'm going to read some items from James Brown. Now, if we wanna place James Brown in the area where he actually had a house, but more importantly, his, his son lived here for longer and served in many capacities. But their property was, even though it extended all the way to Lake Wakabuck, their property and their house was on Ridgefield Avenue. So we're going to hear from the will of James Brown, uh, written, well, he, uh, before, after, written, before he died in 1769. And here is, excuse me. I give and bequeath unto Joanna Brown, my dear and loving wife, <coughs> my Negro man Tower Hill during the term of her natural life. And in case the said Negro man Tower Hill shall live after my said wife's decease, I give him to my son Samuel Brown during the natural life of the said Negro man 
And my will is that my said wife shall have the benefit of one room to live in my mansion house in Norwalk and as she shall choose and 20 pounds paid to her yearly by my executors for the term of her natural life. All right, that took care of his wife, Johanna. Item number one, or uh, item number two, rather, I give and bequeath unto my son, James Brown and his heirs and assigns forever the dwelling house he now lives in at Salem and all the lands that I have, which lieth north of the road or highway leading from Ridgefield to Bedford, which Ridgefield Avenue, which lieth south of a pond called the Long Pond, walk about. I likewise give and bequeath to my said son, James Brown, and to his heirs forever my Negro man, Lucas, and his son, Dyer. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, oh, a sec another item. I give and bequeath unto my daughter, Joanna Brown, and to her heirs and assigns my Negro man, Cato, and the wench he now hath married. And Joanna also got a cow and a calf. So Johanna is the one that uh, we can see in the uh, a later, the 1810 census, which we'll see in a minute. Uh, but she was the one who basically inherited Old Tower. And Old Tower is mentioned quite often in our records because, uh, now I don't know whether he was a freedman at this time uh, in the, the 18, around 1810 or not, but he used to travel from house to house making soap for the different farms. And that brings me back to this pond. This pond is in a swamp called Potash Swamp. And James Brown and his sons and maybe several other relatives were involved in the potash business. The potash that they produced from the, uh, the potassium found uh, from the, the plants growing in this pond was sent and potassium was used for two things, most importantly for fertilizer, but also could be used to make a liquid soap, a detergent kind of a soap. So in his later, year, later years, Old Tower would go from farm to farm uh, with potash and uh, making soap. Soap needs to have lye, fat and potash. So. Uh, that's how uh, Old Tower made a small living for himself. But here's another little little thing from uh, this article on, on James Brown's family. Tower Hill, one of the old family slaves who lived to a great age, but was at last frozen to death during the heavy Christmas snowstorm of 1811, lies buried on a spot named after him by the site of his ancient comrades, Cato, Lucas and Dyer. And I think the next sentence uh, refers to, to Dyer. Obadiah was fond of relating stories of his master's family and telling how deer, bear, wolves, and other game once abounded in the neighborhood of Cross Pond, and especially the wild geese, which he had frequently shot in the marshy grounds, this being probably part of those marshy grounds. Now, I, I apologize for this side of the road screenshot, but this is Ridgefield Avenue, not too far off of uh, where it comes off of Route 35. But as you go up the first hill, this I've been told was uh, an area that was known as Tower Hill and supposedly Tower, Cato, Dyer, and Lucas were all buried in this, somewhere in the vicinity of this hillside. It's on the, uh, the north side of Richfield Avenue as you head toward Pound Ridge. This is the other end of, Pound, of uh, Richfield Avenue going, again, you've gone all the way the several miles of Richfield Avenue and you're coming down to where it meets Boutonville Road or Dingy Road. And uh, this also was Brown property. Uh, I'm not sure whether this house Underneath all of the uh, all of the uh, um, additions you see here was a house probably dating back to the early 1700s, and this possibly could have been Brown property as well. 
now we're going over to the Golden Spread, and this is the Todd homestead. This was the homestead of, of Abraham Todd and Oliver Todd, his brother, if not too far away. But uh, the Todds, the Todds had four slaves between them, and they had a great, again, owned a great deal of property in Golden Bridge and had a large, large farm. Now, this is to just kind of give an idea where Nathan Rockwell, who had one slave, was listed on the 1800 census. This house was not Nathan's house. Nathan Rockwell's house was torn down uh, probably over a century ago. But this, this is the house on Farview Farm that uh, was the wood house. Before that, the area, the farm belonged to the Rockwells. And um, in our most recent iteration, it belongs to Henry Wallace, who was vice president under, under Roosevelt. So this is Farview Farm as it appeared in the late 1800s. And this is the Ebenezer uh, Wood family standing out in front of it. But just an idea that um, Nathan Rockwell lived in South Salem as we know it, know it today. And he had, um, he just had, he had one slave. We'll be coming back to um, Rockwell, I believe, because he also had an indentured servant. Uh, here is the only place I can find Roger Brown. And this is on the census of 1800. And you see that these are just the different men. These are the different, different women. Uh, and he was listed in 18, I guess this is the 1810 census. I stand corrected. Uh, in the 18, 100 census, Roger had five slaves. In the 1810 census, he's got one slave and four other freed persons. So this makes me think that perhaps four of his five slaves were somehow uh, changed their status, possibly, we hope, to freed. Now we come to the second chart, the slave owners and slave distribution in 1810 and 1820. There were, uh, I believe, what were there, 14, one, two, three, four, five, no, there were, in 1810, there were eight slaves. Again, uh, a new name comes up, Nathan Smith, who they're judging from the census, I believe he lived in Golden's Bridge. Abijah Gilbert, or Abijah Gilbert lived in uh, downtown South Salem. Here's Roger Brown again, but again, he's only, he's got still the one, the one enslaved person, the four others appeared under other free. Samuel Lyon is a new name. And Alfred Mead in Wakabuck, Alfred was the son of Enoch Mead. And Alfred, I'm pretty sure, inherited his slaves from his father. And you can see that then in 10 years later, he's, he's down to one. Jane Halstead was the wife of Michael Halstead, who we saw back in, in, eight, in the 1700, 1790 census, who had, who had three slaves down to one, and that one is owned by his wife. Also uh, noted, as I mentioned on those two, Two sentences were other freed persons. And as we really can't tell whether they were freed slaves or whether they were just indentured servants or what they were, John Ely was actually pastor of the Presbyterian Church from 1804 to 1812. And he had one um, other freed person. And he had just come from Connecticut. So I'm wondering if he brought a servant with him. And the one person I forgot to add to this list was Margaret Lewis. And Margaret Lewis was John Lewis, our, the eponymous John Lewis. Martha, uh, Margaret was his wife. I was, I'm sorry, was his mother. So uh, she must have had a servant of some sort as well. But we don't know what kind of servant. All right, now we're off to, uh, this is, 
Abijah Gilbert's, this is the, the Gilbert family house in downtown South Salem. It's not there anymore. It, it was taken down in the 1840s, but it's the house where Major Andre was held prisoner during the Revolutionary War. And the Gilberts, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned before, owned from South Salem, pretty much up to where the Benedicts owned, up by Lake Wakabuck, so up to the north part of town. Lots, lots of land also extending down toward um, Post Office Road and on down toward where Route 35 is today. This is uh, the home, it's called the Homestead. Now it is Susan and James Henry's house. It's at the corner of Schoolhouse Road and Mead Street. It was built by Alfred Mead in 1820. So since he still had one slave on the 1820 census, uh, perhaps that slave lived here with Alfred in the, uh, in the 1820s. This is what the Presbyterian Church looked like about the time of Pastor Ely, who had the one other, the other freed person living with him. So that would, and this church is was on the site of what the present day church is. It just was a the 1826 iteration. It was being built during the time of Mr. Ely's pastorate. This is an interesting um, little take on things. This is Puddin Hill Road going down toward 123 and then over toward Pound Ridge. And uh, this is New Canaan on this side of the road. This is Pound Ridge. This is West Road coming out to Puddin Hill. And this really is um, uh, Pound Ridge, although it morphs into Lewisboro Vista when you go that way. But this is called, um, you can call it Jacqueline's Corners. There was a family named Comstock, Samuel Comstock, who lived in this area. They actually were citizens of Pound Ridge, but at that point, Pound Ridge and the Vista area were basically one in the same in this particular part. And on this corner, when Samuel Comstock, uh, he had several slaves and he emancipated them. We're not sure when. And I could not find Samuel Comstock in any census, whether I looked in Pound Ridge, uh, Salem, or New Canaan that fit the area. But I do have a journal written by Alice Beers Bauer, who grew up on West Road and was quite a prominent citizen in this area. She wrote a journal or wrote a, a history of her, her family that came to town in 1844. And in that journal, she talks about Samuel Comstock, who had uh, a brace of oxen and would do road maintenance and would plow the fields for her, her great great grandfather, but that he had two slaves, Jacqueline and his wife. And when Jacqueline and his wife were freed by the Comstocks, they were given an area in this corner in which to live and they had they had a house and when they died, they were buried right next to the house. And that would be in this general area. Now I've known that story for a long time, but when I was looking in the Ridgefield, uh, his, the history looking for, well, how, how was slavery in Ridgefield at the same time? And I came across an incredible article by Jack Sanders, who's a wonderful uh, Ridgefield historian. And he didn't know, nope, he did not know much about slavery in, in Ridgefield until he came across an article and, from an, a very, very old newspaper, 1870s newspaper. And it talked about uh, slavery and uh, um, also a station on the Underground Railroad and a family named Jacqueline. Now, the Jacklins in Ridgefield were, came were in Ridgefield before the Revolutionary War. They were a freed black family and they sent four or five, if not more, uh, family members to fight in the revolution. The Jacqueline family was quite prominent for many, many years in the Ridgefield archives and they're all, they're documented there. And one of the, uh, 
the Jacklins that was mentioned in Jack's article talked about a Lester Jacklin who, who, who uh, signed up for military service from Lower Salem, possibly a relative of the Jacklin slaves that were emancipated and were part of this, lived on this corner. So I've got to talk to Jack about his Jacklins because uh, they were a very large family and very important in the history of Richfield. And we seem to have some right here in our town. Now we're going to go, we're going to segue from the, uh, the enslaved people of African heritage to the indentured people. And uh, actually this, this is the house of the second indentured person I'm going to talk about. But the first one goes back to Nathan Rockwell, who uh, I pointed out to you lived uh, where Farview Farm, where Henry Wallace lived. So think back to that house uh, as I read the uh, indenture that Nathan Rockwell had. This indenture made the 19th of June in the 12th year of his reign of Georges III of Great Britain, which turned out to be 1772. Oh, and in the year of our Lord, AD 1772, between Nathan Rockwell of Salem, <clears throat> County of Westchester and province of New York of the one part and Ezra Smith Jr. of the other part of Stanford in Fairfield County, doth of his own free will put and bound his daughter, Mary Smith, apprentice until of said Nathan Rockwell and to his wife, Martha Rockwell, until she shall arrive <clears throat> to the age of 18 years, which shall be nine years from the 23rd day of January during this time. And during this time, so she is coming at um, the age of nine, and will be apprenticed until she's 18 for nine years, <clears throat> during which time she shall not absent herself by day or by night without leave from her master or mistress and their lawful commands. Gladly obey, she shall not waste or no, she shall not, she shall not waste nor embezzle her said master. Thereof she shall not contract matrimony nor commit for uh unreadable at cards or dice or any unlawful game game she shall not play but in all things shall behave as a faithful apprentice ought to do and the above said nathan and his wife must find themselves to find their said apprentice during the said turn of term of time they will if her clothing washing and lodging suitable for an apprentice and is to to do theirs faithful endeavor and they will learn her to spin both linen and woolen as her mistress is capable of teaching. Also to learn her to knit and sew and to learn her to read the Bible. And at the end of said term, they are to give to their said apprentice one worsted gown with her other wearing clothes, quilt, cloak, bonnet, two pair of shoes, two pair of stockings, one Bible in testimony of where we have here unto set our hands and seals this day and year, signed uh, Nathan Rockwell. So uh, that was an indenture for this girl of nine uh, to be indentured for nine years. We don't know if she made it or not, but now I'm going to read to you the uh, indenture of, of this family, which is the Cyrus Lawrence family. Uh, Cyrus Lawrence was supervisor of our town for many years. This is a little later. That first one was 1772. This one is almost a hundred years later. But Mr. Lawrence also uh, endeavored to hire or to take, take part in indenture agreements. And this is the first one that he got himself into in uh, December 6, 1867. On that day, Ellen Thomas Gribble of Birmingham, England, commenced work for an indefinite time to be paid what her services are worth, no price agreed upon. He then noted cash paid out to her behalf. To cash paid at boarding house in New York, $2.50, paid for carrying her trunk. 
50 cents. Fare on railroad to Katona, $1.30. Um, he also provided a suitable wardrobe for life in the country. In January, about a month later, January 1868, she was given two yards of calico. Um, she wasn't given, uh, it cost 25 cents. Uh, he bought also for her a pair of shoes for 350, two and a half yards of calico and a few other things. Well, by April, things apparently had not worked out and Ellen Gribble left the employee of the Lawrences and returned to New York City. Um, because on April 6th in his day book, there was a, notific a, notif a, not uh, a notice. By four months work, one month at $3 and three months at $5 equals $18 minus $10.60 for sundries. The woman received a grand total of $8.40 plus an extra 25 cents he threw in for good measure. On April 8th, he notes in his day book, she left for New York. Um, he had a couple of others. The next glance we're going to see on his notebook and his day, day book is on May 1873. That day, Miss Hannah Elizabeth Waters, aged 11 years, came here on trial to hire until she is 18 years of age if she suits and, is a, and a satisfactory bargain can be made. Well, the Lawrences supplied her with two pair of shoes for $2, a new calico dress, $2, two calico dress buttons, uh, with buttons for 250, two aprons at 38 cents, black muslin for underclothes, a dollar, hat trimmings, three dollars, pair of stockings, 30 cents, great suit dress and sack, three dollars, a pair of gloves, 40 cents, ribbons for a sash, a dollar 40, hair ribbons, pink and blue for 80 cents. Well, that was on May, in May 1873. She lasted about, well, she lasted till December 29th, 1874. So she obviously lasted about a year and three quarters. And on that day, this day book says, went home not to return again, was not satisfactory and did not suit us. So by all that money that he paid out for her and her various sundries for, Poor Elizabeth did not meet the bill for the Lawrence family. Now uh, we're going on to was there or was there not presence of the Underground Railroad in our town? Um, this is just a statue of uh, Harriet Tubman. Uh, so over the years, people have asked me if I know if their houses are on the the, uh, the Underground Railroad, and I really don't know. There are several things that might make your house on the Underground Railroad. This is a house in Vista. This is the uh, used to be the old post office until 1903. It was the Deca Wright and Tom um, Wright House. It's near the Vista, the, across from the Vista Market in that general area. Uh, so that that house was built probably in the 1870s. I forget the exact date. The Brady House in Golden's Bridge, the Brady Mansion. Uh, just recently, somebody mentioned that they thought this house was on the Underground Railroad. This house is right on Highway 138 in Golden's Bridge. Uh, again, on a main road, as was the house we just saw. And here's another house, which unfortunately, the trees need to be trimmed. This house is on Bowton Road. It's the Gilbert home back, um, not Abijah Gilbert, but his um, a relative, probably his nephew's house, the Stephen Gilbert house, and was built in 1815, which meets one of the <clears throat> qualifications. If uh, you think your house might have been on the Underground Railroad, first of all, it would have to be, have been built during the time of the Underground Railroad, which was any time from uh, the late 17, early 1800s till uh, before 1840. And a better reason would be if a Quaker or an abolitionist lived in this, in this house. Um, it doesn't, the first thing you should 
look for is not the little nooks and crannies in your basement, although those would be good, or caves on the property. But uh, when was the house built? and who were the owners. So this house is on Bountain Road in South Salem. This was the first one I was ever heard, ever told that uh, possibly on the Underground Railroad. So we have <clears throat> three in different parts of town. To try to put this in perspective, this is a map of the Underground Railroad, the main ones in New York State. Here you have the Hudson River, which was definitely a route because uh, earlier they can go by they would go by land under night, but toward the 1840s and 50s and the later years, uh, when there were not so many people, it was a little less dangerous uh, for people trying to flee and not quite as many people following them to recapture them. They could go actually by barge up the Hudson and then they would get to Albany and either continue on up toward Montreal or cross through here and get into Toronto or straight across and then by boat up to Kingston in, in Canada. So that, and these, these people would be coming from Pennsylvania mainly and you can see the different areas Western, Central, and Eastern Pennsylvania. All right, I'll bring it up again, because here we have another, probably a main route. And this one would have come from New York City through Lower Westchester. And you might say right through where we are in this little elbow. And we know that Hartford was part of the Underground Railroad, New Haven as well. People would come up by boat, uh, be brought up by boat in uh, Long Island Sound to New Haven, and then on up to Hartford. And from here, uh, although it doesn't show because this is New York, not New England, they would have gone on up and up to Vermont and up into up into uh, to Canada. So uh, let's we in reading uh, Jack Sanders article. And as I say, it was new to him. He wrote this article in, seven, in, in 2020. And it wasn't too long before, before then that he had discovered that there was a underground railroad station in Ridgefield. And if you look on the map, look for Ned's Mountain Road. Ned's Mountain is in the very Northern part of Ridgefield. And it was a way station on the Underground Railroad. Ned Armstrong and his wife were free black people, fairly well off with a nice farm. And they had a way station, a documented way station on the Underground Railroad. Let's get back to our town. Now, I apologize for this really terrible map, but I took it off the internet in a screen, in a, a clip and snip. And it wasn't very, uh, clear to start with, and I think somebody wants to sell the map rather than, than have me use it to tell you. But uh, Westchester County, there, there were a lot, there was a lot of underground railroad activity. But basically, uh, now this is New Rochelle. In Lower Westchester, March, Larchmont, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, there was a, a large black population down there even then, and it, they were close to New York City. And so it was fairly logical that people trying to escape would coming north. If they were not going by, by river, they would get into this area where there were Quakers. And then they were able to go from Quaker uh, Safeway to, uh, up to other Quakers. And in our area, uh, I, I think this says uh, like Sleepy Hollow. It's very hard to read, but I know this says Mount Pleasant. This says Pleasantville. Pleasantville and Chappaqua were uh, all involved in a very large Quaker meeting. And so these, these two communities would harbor, would be, have stations on the Underground Railroad. And then from Chappaqua, the next really important and known station would have been Brewster. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, would have been Katona. And Katona would have been the John Jay House, which for many years they did not realize that they had 
um, significant uh, history with the Underground Railroad. John, John Jay was a slave owner, but he also was early uh, involved in the Manumission Slave Acts in New York State. And he, he did free his slaves eventually. But it was a way station in the early 1800s for escaped slaves. This is only a map of Westchester, but as I mentioned by mistake, calling this Brewster. The next important Quaker stop was up in Brewster. Uh, over here would, uh, would be uh, probably Peekskill. Peekskill also has a, a large African-American history and also was a way station on the uh, Underground Railroad. But let's go back to um, Bedford. And this is pound, this is a newest map, so that it's showing Ward Pound Ridge Reservation. But here's Bedford, here's Route 35. We're going to go to a different map. This is a map from 1797, which might be more to our to help us. It's showing the major roads and the different post roads in 1797 that go through our town. Uh, Again, here we have, let me see if I can orient myself. Um, we have stage road, this is Cross River. And this would be, um, let's see the way into, I get very confused with all these roads, but this would, <clears throat> this would kind of be the way that uh, Cross River, that Route 35 would go today. This would come along from the Cross River area. This would be going down to Bedford to uh, the John Jay Homestead. This is, think of it as Route 35. Think of this as Spring Street today, coming down past the Episcopalian Church, which wasn't there in 1797. But the Presbyterian Church was, the White Church was, and this was the Post Road. It would come on out along Spring Street where when you got um, back to this road coming from, uh, let's think of this as Ridgefield Avenue, which was the uh, Ridgefield to, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the Bedford to Ridgefield Road. It was the Hartford Post Road because uh, here's where the uh, Post Road coming from New York and Bedford would meet the Post Road coming from, uh, from the Poundridge and Bedford area, going into Ridgefield, it would cross the state line into Ridgefield and continue as the Hartford Post Road up to where I was talking about where Ned's Mountain was. So you can see back in the last, the end of the 18th century, the early 19th century, there were a lot of important, important roads, not too many little ancillary roads. And this would have been the road going out to to Vista, which would have gone to New Canaan. And so this very well, because Deca Wright's house would have been along this road very well. It could have been part of that uh, railroad connection going to the Hartford, the Hartford Railroad line. Uh, let me bring this back. Uh, this is, this would be what we call Oscalita Road right now, which shows it going through Lake Wakabuck, but um, this would be this would be Mead Street, and this road would have gone right up. This was the uh, the Vermont Post Road, so this would have gone straight up this way. So past past Lake Wakabuck, all this is all Mead Street. This is where uh, we would have seen Elmden, and this is where we would have seen uh, Alfred Mead's house, Enoch Mead's house, and on this. Um, that Boughton Road that um, I talked about would have been probably <clears throat> one of these roads. So not exactly a main road, but that's not to say that it could not have been a hideaway, a, a station on the Underground Railroad. More for conjecture. Uh, it's more for a lot of research. And let me just go back. This was a, another painting that uh, is called The Abolitionist. And I think um, at this point, I'm coming to an end. So I think we'll open it to 
uh, any questions that people might have. This is just a very pretty uh, primitive painting and it's called The Abolitionist. So um, uh, again, a New York State <clears throat> piece of folk art. And then I do wanna share with you the sources that I use because I really needed sources. My only source had been a few a few pieces of files out of my archives and uh, the census. So these were some uh, books that were very, uh, helped me a lot. The History of Rye, History of Westchester County and uh, by Bolton and by Scharf. Francis Duncombe's wonderful book about Katona. And this, I would, I would urge everybody who uh, made it through my wanderings to, uh, just Google Farmers, Soldiers, and Slaves by Jack Sanders. It is available, I believe, at the Richfield Library website, or um, just try Googling Jack Sanders and that, that um, it's about a 60 page article, it's incredible. And then this was also very interesting, the New York Slavery Index. Scarsdale Historical Society has a lot on slavery in Lower Westchester. Here's the scrapbook that told me about the Comstock slaves, uh, the Jacqueline slaves who were buried at the corner of Puddin Hill, and anything else came from my archives. So I thank you for making it through this uh, ramble, and I think Liz is going to open it up to, to questions, and I'm going to hit escape and hope that I can see everybody else. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, th that was great. And I was going to say, I know you've been doing a lot of talking between our programs and the parks and recreation. So, you know, have a glass of water and I'll, um, we have a couple of questions and uh, comments in the chat. So I'll read those. And then afterwards, if people want to unmute themselves and ask questions, they can do so. Okay. Um, the first question, um, someone asks, what would the life of a freed Black person in Lewisboro look like around the year 1800? Well, actually, I think I really didn't say uh, what jobs they probably had. They were, our farms were small, not like the plantations. And so they were farm workers. They probably helped run the mills. They were blacksmiths. They were carpenters. Um, so uh, their, how good their life was, uh, you know, I'm assuming, but I don't know that they weren't being beaten and, and, and hanged and are lynched and things like that if they were caught with doing what they shouldn't be doing. Um, they, at least according, leading, coming from Jack's article about Ridgefield, uh, probably some of them didn't, have their own quarters. They probably lived in the owner's house, in some part of the owner's house. And uh, in some cases, they probably even took their meals together. Uh, I don't have any notes in anything I've ever read about slave quarters. The nearest I can think to that is when I think of Sal Salinger's Orchards. Uh, they have a lot of migrant workers and they have separate housing for their migrant workers. Um, that made me think, well, did, did the slave owners have separate quarters here? But I've never seen anything like that. So perhaps they did live in a section of the, uh, the owner's house, which some of the owner's homes weren't all that great. You saw the Benedict house, which was uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty basic. The one that is now the Coles house. Um, as far as church, Again, there are no records, but in in Connecticut, uh, Jack mentioned that often the the uh, enslaved people would go to the whatever church their owners went to. They just would sit, obviously, in the back, uh, in separate sections. So, uh, I think uh, I, I I don't know any more than because yeah. nobody wrote anything down. It's not in any journals. Well, that would be the next, the next question was, do we have any records of artifacts from the actual enslaved people of Lewisboro as opposed to the families who own them? No, no. Uh, I suppose 
in I, I don't know the fam the big families like uh, looked like the Benedicts and the Meads had slaves for a while the Halsteads in north in the northern part of town. There are any artifacts they might be in those families archives, but not anything that anybody's ever come and shown me. Um, I, no shackles that I know of yeah. or things like that. Um, someone else said, it is surprising to me to learn that indentured persons and contracts were still going on in the late 1800s, not 1700s. Well, the Cyrus Lawrence, uh, family, you you saw what I read. It was the last, the last quarter of the uh, of the 1800s. Um, he was basically using them as uh, as workers in their house. But they were promised. They had to prompt the, the owners had to promise to teach them certain skills. Maybe maybe like the the, the little girl who who came to him in 18 uh, 18. Seven, the, la the latter one, I think, was supposed to learn knitting and and sewing and uh, that sort of thing. Maybe, who knows, maybe her family had so many children, they needed to arm some of them out. That might, I think that might have been a, a reason for some of these people. And there were always, there were the indentures for the, uh, the trades. Like way back at the beginning, the little fellow with the uh, hobo stick, was um, indentured to a blacksmith, I believe. And uh, uh, after four years, he'd had enough. So he didn't live up to his, in his indenture and uh, was being sought to be brought home. Okay, now, this is really interesting. Um, someone wrote that an article circulated recently suggesting that increased Miller Elementary School might be built on the burial site of enslaved people. Do you know about that? Or can you shed any light on this? Only when I saw in that, I saw that same post. And uh, I do not know, I had never heard about it until somebody brought that up in one of these uh, neighborhood Facebook things. Uh, Increase Miller Cemetery is on Increase Miller Road. Uh, and that's where he and his wife were buried. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if, I really don't know. And I would not advise picking up the school property to look for these graves. Well, I remember when we were talking the other day when we were, you know, practicing, and I asked you about Jacqueline's Corner, because um, you said that they, you know, they were given the land and they were buried there, and that's like right on the corner of Footing Hill Road. And so, what happened with, you know, the house that they owned and the fact that they were buried there? Uh, I think that house that's there now uh, is a, quite a large modern. Uh, modern house, probably built in the 70s or 80s. And I think that property, and this would happen all over because the, the property would be uh, disturbed because there'd be farming, the farming uh, uh, where you had your farm or, or working your farm would, would change. And I think probably a lot of, of, of these family grave sites were, were just, uh, bulldozed over or not bulldozed would would be uh, destroyed when there was a different purpose for that particular part of the property. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I, I can't imagine <clears throat> that um, these burials were, were uh, you know, they were very crude. So uh, whether actually an interesting thing about Tower Hill, <clears throat> the one who traveled the itinerant soap maker, um, he, he died, I mentioned he died in the great fever of 1811. About 20 people, I believe, died in that fever in our town. And Aaron Keeler was the coffee ma uh, coffin maker. Now, I don't know whether he would have made towers often, but Aaron Keeler, the, cof the coffin maker, died about a month after Tower Hill did from, from the great winter fever. So uh, uh, that made me think, well, I wonder if if uh, the town coffin maker was also making coffins for, for the enslaved and freed people. But I would imagine their graves were very crude. Mm. Um, someone asked, what rights did indentured servants have? I can only tell you 
what I, you know, in this particular, for these particular families, it would have been what I read to you. Uh, not many. Not many. They probably had a place to sleep, a place to eat. They were closed. They were, uh, uh, their wants that way, their material wants as far as clothing and blankets and bedding were supplied. Uh, and supposedly they got, what they got out of it was, was learning to run a household. If, if they lasted, but they were, they came at such an early age. They, they came at a very young age. Right. Um, someone asked, what was the total population of the area in the 1790s to put the number of slaves in perspective? Okay, it was probably around 12 to 1800 people. So if you consider that uh, 18 slaves, for 1,800 people, small percentage. Okay, and then we have a couple people put links. Someone put a link to the piece on Ned's Mountain from the Ridgefield Historical Society in the chat. So I'll mm -hmm. save that. Um, okay. And then there's the the what about uh, the Ridgefield Library about farmer soldier slaves that PDF Jack Sanders piece. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So I would I would advise people following that link and and reading that. He's got a lot about this, a lot about the Jacklands and a lot about how the the uh, the blacks, the freed the freed blacks and others served in the Revolutionary War. He's done a lot of incredible research that way. Okay. Um, so someone I see, said, oh sorry. No, I just saw Harvey's thing about abolitionists. Uh, I haven't studied, <laughs> haven't studied that, um, and I, I can't answer that. Oh, uh, that okay. can be our next program. Do you want? <laughs> All right. Um, someone wrote in many places throughout the U.S. The institutions and systems associated with slavery lived on after slavery had formally ended. What did that look like in our area or neighboring towns? Well, as I said, one statistic I had was by 1830. Uh, slave. There were no slaves mentioned in in Westchester County. Seventy five in the state of New York, but there was still these hangers on because this uh, graduated slavery, which was first enacted in 1799 and then again in 1817, uh, there were probably still some some slaves. Uh, just sotto voce, you may not have, you may not know about, but or if they weren't listed as slaves, they were probably they could still have been indentured servants, which would be serving in a house. They were freed, but they were still servants and not being paid. Mm. Um, I don't know if that, that answers the yeah. question. Someone had an interesting question: Would the free black families working the Underground Railroad? have been coordinated with the Quakers um, working side by side, but not together? I think they were working side by side. I think all these were, uh, all these stations were somehow related uh, so that people could, could get from one station to another. And I'm sure uh, what I should also mention, which I didn't, uh, which might bring the Brady House into contention as a place. Uh, there was a Quaker meeting in Golden's Bridge during this time. So there were Quakers in Golden's Bridge. They were associated with the Quaker meeting in Somers. So Somers Quaker meeting was a lot larger and uh, uh, a more important meeting than, well, a larger one than one in Golden's Bridge, but uh, and the Golden's Bridge one eventually integrated with the one in Somers. So there were a number of Quakers in Golden's Bridge. I, there was not, I don't know of any Quakers who lived in South, in the Salem part or the Cross River part. Uh, there may have been some in Cross River, but um, I don't know of any families I've ever read about in, in South Salem that were, uh, or, or Vista that were that were that belonged to a Quaker meeting. They could have traveled all the way over to Golden's Bridge, but I haven't. The names I've seen associated with the Quaker meeting in Golden's Bridge 
did not include any from the South Salem area. And here's a question that I think probably came up when you were showing the maps. Do you know why Ridgefield Ave is also refer referred to as High View R Road? Oh, well, that's the Pound Ridge name for it. It's it, at the border, it goes from being High View to Ridgefield Avenue. Uh, it's kind of like if you come from uh, uh, Cross River to South Salem, it's the South Salem Road. And if you go from South Salem to Cross River, it's the Cross River Road. Uh, it's it's kind of like in a lot of towns that you visit, you get to a corner in a, in a town you don't know, and all of a sudden you're on a different street. Um, but High View is the name into Pound Ridge. And if you travel across Ridgefield Avenue and you uh, take away all the trees that are there now, it would have been a high view. You probably could have seen clear across to the ridges in Pound Ridge Reservation. It would have been very open area because it would have been farmed. So high view makes sense for that part of the road. And the Ridgefield road comes from what I mentioned. It was the, the Bedford or the Pound Ridge, no, the Bedford Ridgefield Highway. It was the main road. Okay, well, that's all the questions that we have in the chat. I don't know if anyone wanted to unmute and ask a question. Otherwise, we can- oh, I saw up. one that, I saw one down there that said, uh, <laughs> an E in somebody, I think, that asked about, was our history more, uh, uh, common with the Connecticut history in that early time. And uh, it was because we were all part of the, uh, the, the boundary dispute, the oblong, which uh, is another topic, which is too confusing. If this is confusing, the oblong, where uh, people went from one side of the border to the other side of the border, you might wake up uh, a week later and be in Connecticut, and the next week you're back in New York. So that's a whole nother a whole nother uh, study that we that we could do sometime next fall when we're getting bored of going yeah. outside and playing in the leaves. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, we are very much a New England state, at least over here in the uh, the eastern part of town and in the southern part of town. Whereas if you're in Golden's Bridge, you would have been in Cortland Manor. You would have been uh, you weren't even part governmentally of our town until 1788. So uh, that part, if you lived in Golden's Bridge, you couldn't be in the government in uh, the Salem, the Salem government. Uh, and, and then and it, it changed, the, ma the manors were broken up and, and Golden's Bridge became part of, part of our town uh, uh, politically. So, where I'm sitting right now, I would be sitting in Connecticut if it were 1731. So a lot, a lot of things are very would be considered the same. I have one, oh, I'm button. sorry. Oh, there you go. What? That, Sue? that was the question I was going to read, but go ahead. You can oh, read okay. it. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. Um, she was asking about how tender feet that term it, or is used to identify runaway indentured servants? No, 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 no. How that one specific runaway boy was known to have tender feet. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh only that. you. <laughs> only you. Uh, I don't even know if he was caught to find out if his feet were tender after all that. I don't know. Tender feet, maybe if he was a boy scout, he could be a tender foot. Don't know. It just was <laughs> intriguing that would be mentioned to identify him. It would. It would definitely. I I don't know because he he didn't have shoes. I haven't read the ad in a while. But he had two pair of shoes. Oh, he did. I believe so. Okay, I will go back and, and read. <laughs> let me know. I will let you know, dear friend. <laughs> Okay, um, Maureen, here's another one in the chat. Um, to your knowledge, has there ever been a town or library request for families with a long history in the area to make their personal historical documents available? Wait a minute. The well, I mean, you have a lot of documents that are from the families. I have a lot of, yeah, I have a lot of ephemera. I have uh, deeds. I have, uh, uh, 
that one indenture from the Brockwell family. And I have another one that I couldn't find. I have day books, I have diaries um, and that sort of thing. Yes, and I do get a lot of requests for genealogy questions, most of which I would say a small percentage can I put my hand on right away. But um, the interesting thing is, and it's probably still true today, some families are incredible at um, keeping their records and some families could care less. Um, the Hoyt family, the Gilbert family, the Reynolds family um, are incredible at keeping their records, but um, not, not everyone is. It's, it's great when you uh, keep a diary. I keep, whenever I talk to kids at school, keep a diary, keep a journal because even though you think what's happening right now is not important, there'll be somebody like me in 30 years wanting to know what was it like during the pandemic of 2019 or 2020? And, uh, and what was it like? What games did you play? What did you do for entertainment? Uh, what did you eat? Who were your friends? Uh, all this will be coming to people uh, like me, historians in a few years. And the other thing, I have a lot of letters, mainly from one or two families, but nobody writes letters nowadays. People are on the internet, people are, uh, anything they write is probably in the cloud, but look at how technology changes and can you access that and how can an historian really access that quickly like i can go to my files and find a letter from somebody so uh, uh, that, that it's important to keep a a, peep, a paper trail at some point i think because uh, i've gone uh, i have a lot i have almost a hundred interviews on tape on cassette tapes i now have to find a way to put those interviews to digitize them because the tapes are getting old some of them are from the 1970s and the incredible the information on these tapes is incredible but uh we finally last week bought a tape player because i couldn't play these tapes and uh, uh the technology changes it went from tapes went from uh, to uh to uh, vcr tapes to, to cds to dvds to the internet so uh any way you do it, write your history down. There you go. All right. Okay, Maureen, thank you so much for another wonderful program. And hopefully <laughs> we'll be at, we'll have you back here in the fall. <laughs> Maybe live, who knows? Yeah, that would be good. I only hope. And next week, if you want to hear about Cross River, I'll be on the Park and Rec site for Cross River. And then we'll be doing South Salem, Lewisboro, and Walkabout. So it's going to be a spring of Hamlet touring. But thanks, Liz, for all your help. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> so long.